Welcome to one of the first sessions of this conference on fossil fuel supply and climate policy. Uh, this session will be about indigenous and community-led resistance to fossil fuels. I will be your moderator. Uh, my name is Jimena Warnars. I work at the Ford Foundation based out of New York. And it is really um, my pleasure and honor to be here and to be able to moderate this session and being among, among friends and colleagues. Um, I'm especially excited because I've also worked very closely and, and, and supported a number of indigenous resistance and litigation um, in various countries for about two decades, so I'm very excited to do that. So we are here to listen, to learn, and to share um, some innovative and promising experiences from local struggles, um, stopping fossil fuel projects, which is, as you all know, very important for our climate, for territories, for oceans, for livelihoods and indigenous rights. We have 75 minutes, and I will present the panelists, and each of them, each of them will share their stories. And then we'll save the questions and discussions for the end. So please keep those questions in mind or noted down for, for, the, for the end of the session. Um, to the panelists, we each one of you have 10 minutes. And I apologize beforehand if I cut you off, <laughs> if you go past the 10 minutes. Um, but so then, let me start with the introductions. Um, in the order of presentation, Nontle Mbutuma from the Amidaba Crisis Committee from South Africa. Johan Lorenzen from the Richard Spohr Incorporate Attorneys, Angelina Robertson from Stand Earth, Kevin Kooning from Amazon Watch, and Kate Horner from Amazon Frontlines. So without any further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Nogli. Uh, thank you so much for get this opportunity. Uh, yes, my name is Nogli from South Africa. Uh, I'm a human rights land defender. Um, yeah, we've been facing with quite a lot of um, issues uh, in South Africa because of the crisis economy that we are facing, especially in the rural areas uh, where people are living because it seems it's a space for um, uplifting economy. It's just been known as a place where there's no people, whereas we are living there. Uh, we've been facing with quite a lot of challenges uh, where the mining, they discovered the minerals where we're living, where our livelihood um, is there. And uh, the government always uh, go ahead and give the mining rights to those mining companies uh, without uh, consulting people, without uh, considering that we're existing. And we as communities fighting those battles not just for the livelihood and also for the planet, which is something that uh, at this stage, uh, our state is not consider the planet as something needs to be protected. The only thing that is ahead is making profit. Uh, there was first uh, attempt where they discovered titanium in our ancestral land, and we fought that battle. And we won uh, in 2018, where the judgment says that uh, the people of Amadiba must give a full, free, prior informed consent uh, before any mining right, which was a big judgment for, for all of us, not for the people of South Africa. Because mostly when these mining companies, they come to our communities, they're always promising jobs to our communities without even consider that um, these jobs are short term. But what they've done, they destroy the sustainable development that is there. And they don't even consider that. You know, when we won that, uh, it was a good thing. But unfortunately, um, our own state willing to appeal uh, that judgment, that uh, if that judgment it goes ahead, is going to cause a chaos. That means there will be no mining in South Africa. Because all the communities will use um, this judgment that um, they must give a consent, which is something uh, they contradict themselves. Because they are part of um, the UN binding treaties, where the free 
free prior informed consent they sign for. But now when it comes to the judgment, they just differ. And it was not only that case. Also, while we're fighting the land uh, uh, mining uh, recently, um, they just discovered oil and gas in our wild coast um, uh, ocean where they want to explore oil and gas. Again, as communities, we stand up against a shell, which is the company that they want to extract those oil and gas. And we said no oil and gas, but yes to ocean and yes to life. That's what we're saying. Again, we were alone at our own when we fight that battle. Uh, the state always um, sleeping with the same blanket with big corporates, and they will keep saying that um, they're going to create jobs um, because uh, our community is one of the poor of the poorest. But if our community is one of the poor of the poorest, why they choose um, the the oil and gas because oil and gas is not going to create any jobs for our community instead it's going to create poverty right now in our community there is no poverty our livelihood is dependent from the ocean and we are fishing in a sustainable way where we are not uh, taking everything where we just fish for it not fish to sell you know this is how we should do things but you can see that even if even if we fish to eat the, 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 the regulations are very biased towards the communities. Uh, we're given the licenses that are very limited to catch the fishes, but the big companies, they're given the big licenses where they can just wipe everything in the ocean. That is why also on the issue of Shell, our own government were just going ahead and then to grant um, the, the, the right to explore uh, the oil and gas where we interdict that and many people were saying that no uh, you are wasting your time at uh, this time around shell it's a biggest company in the world uh, it has money now you we are just a community you don't have money don't fight shell shell is, is a giant um uh, a company but we know that we are small we are few but we are very well organized that's what we are proud of and they said you know many people said that you know to fight shell uh, you don't have e enough information to argue because, you know, our communities are just been known of uneducated. And we told them that, yes, we are uneducated, but when it comes to the ocean and land, we are the professors and nobody can tell us anything. We live, we born, and we don't need to go to be schooled about our ocean and about our land. That is how we just get confidence to go to court and fight that uh, uh, issue of Shell. And we warn this year again that uh, Shell must consider our spirituality, our culture, and also uh, the, 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 the climate impact, which is something that uh, it tells us uh, our judicial system, it still works in South Africa. And uh, if it wasn't, the way South Africa is in crisis, uh, we were not expecting much in our uh, uh, court of law, but uh, we were really, really surprised that uh, our judicial system it still works when they also mentioned the climate crisis that we are facing because we were just worried that uh, the, the energy crisis that we are, we are facing in South Africa, it will m m give more impact to our judgment that they will judge according to the crisis that we are facing because uh, the energy crisis, I can say South Africa is in dark right now. It's load shedding left and center. Uh, it's not about we don't have enough energy. The energy is there. The problem is the corruption because there is a lot of um, a power station that are not being uh, fixed. Now, uh, instead of fixing the existing power station, they are just changing the wheel to say, no, let's go and have our own oil and gas, which is not the way we're supposed to do things right now um we just need to all of us to look at the climate change that we are facing at the uh, at the ecological crisis that we are facing but it's clear that our government is not looking for that it's looking for making more profit that is the situation that we are facing and we said that before the court judgment uh, in september this year we're saying that if we lose this judgment against shell it means that 
the planet lost. And if we win, it means that the planet win. This is our argument right now. And right now, it means that the planet win. But uh, it's not the end of the battle. This is the beginning of the battle. Because a, a few days, Shell, together with our own state, they said that they're going to appeal the decision. Uh, which means there's still a, way, a, a long way to go to fight. And we're still going to fight all what we need as communities. We need to be organized ourselves because um, the enemy hate the organized communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the inspiring stories and really lots of similarities with what we just heard in the in the opening session with our keynote speaker. Um, over to you, Johan. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm Johan. I'm, uh, it's been the privilege of my lifetime to be one small part of uh, the wonderful legal team that represents Nontle's community, which is often called the Kolobeni community, which is a village along the coast of the Anadiba community. And I was saying to Kate, it's been quite a challenge thinking about what what to say in this in this forum so it's been shifting a lot as i go along um and i um but it my initial thought in the title is um land first and the rest followed um and a reflection on the modest role that lawyers have played and i i want to still start with that because I think as there's a growing appreciation of the powerful role that indigenous peoples are playing, I think in, in stopping um, fossil fuels and in, in limiting production of coal, in, in limiting uh, the extract, unsustainable extractivism, I think there needs to be a reflection of how do people like those who are in this room stand in solidarity with those communities and work with them. And um, what what has been quite useful for for me is is coming with with my small skill set and being one tool in the toolkit that the community has for resistance and that the the broader picture of the community of the Kolobeni community's resistance to extractivism has been fundamentally about their self determination and I I do want to just make clear uh, I, I, by the end. I want everyone to appreciate that there's no using that communities aren't just a tool in the toolkit of environmentalists to stop climate change. That that won't work if you are not standing with communities in the full spectrum of what their self determination means. That's the only way that that, they, that this is a a victorious strategy. So um, a little bit about. Um, the way uh, about the way we approached the case, which um, this it was in early November last year that a note that notices went up in newspapers that Shell was planning on commencing a seismic survey of the Wild Coast, um, where they where a ship, um, ironically enough, after Namonte's presentation called the Amazon Warrior was going to be blasting every 10 seconds for five months along the wild coast. And the notice was met with nationwide outrage, with environmentalists swiftly organizing protests around shell stations and people going to beaches to save the wild coast. A petition was put to the South African government to block the seismic blasting and gain thousands of signatures. And environmentalists went to court with specialist lawyers to bring a stop to the blasting. That was unsuccessful. It was really only the mobilization of communities, including Kolobeni, but throughout the Wild Coast, who were then able to articulate their stories in a way that was powerful enough for the court to intervene, that led to the, the, the warship, as our, as our advocate called it, um, being stopped on the 28th of December. And uh, just a word in terms of the strategy is it's we're often encouraged as lawyers to be creative, uh, to win these types of cases. And I've always found that to be not quite the right, the right word. It's our clients who are meant, who are creative. And it's, we're just um, creatures of instructions, as we say in the law. 
Um, I've been reflecting on these words from Zadie Smith, that writing is routinely described as creative, and that's never struck her as the correct word. Planting tulips is creative. To plant a flower is to participate in some way in the cyclic miracle of creation. Writing is control, it's taking this large and shapeless bewilderment and pouring it into molds of our devising. And so Nontle is sketched out, and we'll get to some of the pictures. Um, that uh, the, the Kolobeni community is living and breathing the cyclic miracle of creation. It's our job as lawyers um, to mold that, that miracle into a story compelling enough for judges sitting thousands of kilometers away. And the reason why I'm saying this is not just about our approach. It's to say that as you consider ways that you can be standing in solidarity with the community, be with communities around the world, including the Montes, including Nontles, be thinking about how the creativity comes from those communities and how you can bring your own skill set and your own unique uh, background to be standing in solidarity with the, the communities. Um, turning back to the land, I mean, the, the phrase some of you might know, the um, land first and the rest shall follow, um, was the, Pan the liberation movement uh, the, of the Pan-African Congress captured imaginations. But for me, what's been striking about that is it certainly seems that the colonialists took that approach, that of claiming political jurisdiction of land and the rest following. Uh, when we look at the history of both conservation and extraction in Southern Africa, where um, black people, were on top of minerals, they were forcibly removed, uh, where they were in, and often conservation would be developed in as part and parcel of those removals together with commercial agriculture. And this was meant to change, of course, uh, after apartheid. And unfortunately, it hardly did. So our firm first got into these fights around the Mohala Quena platinum mine, the world's largest open cast platinum mine. And there, the democratic government decided that what was sufficient was the traditional leadership's agreement. And they allowed platinum mining to commence and expected communities to negotiate compensation for as blast, mine blasts cracked their homes, as their grazing and plowing fields went under mountains of mine waste. And um, we came in too late and, and the court said that they would not grant an interdict because the community had not approached the court timelessly. Um, and when my boss Richard went onto the radio to call the mine's conduct corrupt, two things happened. Um, he was personally sued uh, for millions of rands in defamation, and a social worker also heard him uh, and invited him down to visit Kolobeni. Um, and so learning lessons from those communities and learning lessons from the global movement towards free prior and informed consent, and principally learning lessons from the community. Lessons, uh, a strategy was developed for asserting self-determination that was rooted in the community's own indigenous form of democratic and accountable self-governance with an ethic of stewardship of the land that they, that they had. And so in fending off one of the reasons why the community was able to fend off the titanium mine was having gone through the 1990s, having an initial moment of hope and aspiration with democracy where the government came and worked with them to develop community-based conservation schemes where jobs were being created and wealth was being created. So there's a very clear sense of an alternative way forward for the community. So it wasn't just that we're saying the community says no to mining, it's not only it can, a right of consent is not only a right to say no, it's a right to say yes enthusiastically. And so when, oh, with uh, resisting a toll road, with resisting the imposition of a smart city, of, uh, of the mine um, and of uh, a gambling company, the community, when Shell came, the partnership with the lawyers was not something where we were learning on the job. What, what the community's voice was. So we are, the community was able to articulate this powerful narrative, sadly out of practice, sadly out of uh, a muscle of having to go to court. And so 
Um, it came together really by chance with a few phone calls being made that this interdict came together. It very nearly didn't happen. And that's where I think the conversations of having you in the room um, from all of your various backgrounds is so important because there's, there's too much chance if you're leaving it up to lawyers and, and the courts, as Nantes says. And there's also nothing ro romantic about expecting communities to use their own parties to prevent these developments from happening. Our late uh, chairperson, Bazooka Khadebe, was assassinated and he's still, we still don't, haven't had justice for him. And so the solidarity of this group that I'm hoping for is a solidarity both to help the community be a stronger shield for themselves and for the planet, but also to change the game so that the community doesn't need to be fighting and putting their bodies on the line so that we can have a transformed world and that's that's what I'm hoping for out of out of you. Thanks for your patience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it's amazing to also hear about all the different kinds of tools there, and 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 a, a sad point to end on uh, about how also these uh, resistance movements also lead to um, a lot of repression and and um, and killings of friends and colleagues. Um, so we'll hear now from Angelina first, I believe, and then from Ken. Thanks, and thanks for those um, powerful and compelling presentations. Um, and um, almost for creating a, a perfect segue. <laughs> because I also am just um, sort of providing a service um, and pouring my uh, skill set into a context in which um, indigenous people have shown leadership and creativity in creating opposition strategies. Um, so we'll be talking about how we can inform Indigenous-led opposition strategies with supply chain research, which is a very narrow um, and, you know, admittedly quite dull area of research sometimes, um, but can have some important, um, can provide some important opportunities. Yes. Oh, thank you. So just to give you context of why we do this research, um, the impetus was really about a request from indigenous organizations fighting oil and gas in the Amazon to find new ways to, one, build leverage, and two, to open up different avenues of accountability for the industry and for the government. They had been fight seeing, um, and I, we heard this morning from a, a, a Nimonte and her powerful presentation about the rights violations, the lack of free part informed consent, uh, pollution and sickness in communities, food insecurity, water uh, quality issues, um, oil spills happening daily in the region, uh, food and um, biodiversity loss and deforestation. I'm just going to start my timer so I don't run over. Um, <laughs> and in corruption and violence. Um, and they really wanted to know how, what other actors in this uh, constellation of strategies could be targeted to help move the needle on, on finding leverage and accountability. Um, and they asked us to look at customers for Amazon Oil and also for the banks that were financing the industry. So we put out a report because what we found when we tracked Amazon Oil was that um, almost 15, almost 50 percent of all the oil that's exported from the Amazon crude oil goes to California. Um, we found tracing the oil through the refineries and also through the consumption patterns within the state and through its exports that about one in nine gallons of gas, diesel and jet fuel consumed in the state comes from the Amazon and about 89 percent of that comes from Ecuador. Uh, sorry, from the Ecuadorian Amazon. In Southern California, it's even more concentrated and it's Los Angeles International Airport, for example, it's one in every six gallons of jet fuel pumped into a plane comes from the Amazon. So this is a Sankey diagram, something I'm quite familiar with in my work. And um, it, just to give you a sense of what, it, what it's like to trace oil, uh, we have to uh, look at various different data sources. Um, and we look at crude stream characteristics and crude streams to try to uh, geographically identify the origin of the oil in country and then look through all these different 
um, uh, trade flow data sets, exports and imports to trace it out of the country and um, find where it's going. And then we look at this pattern over, um, we hope, five to ten years in order to uh, see if our, what we're seeing are steady trends. Um, and uh, this is really just the tip of the iceberg. So tracing it into country and then um, allowing uh, that um, sort of informing indigenous opposition strategies with this information is really an opportunity for them to engage with the state of California. Uh, but also we have to think about what the impact of um, strategies like asking the California government to consider reducing their reliance on Amazon oil. So some next steps of our research to look at leakage, to look at what other oil sources might come into play if Amazon oil is taken out of the equation and how are there just transition strategies that could support an overall reduction in oil consumption in a, in a, a place like California, um, which would allow for the reduction of uh, their reliance on Amazon oil, but without shifting it to say Arctic oil or tar sands oil. We also looked at um, at banks and we found first something surprising in our customs data that we could actually trace trade financing which turned out to be an important source of credit for the oil trade from the Amazon um, and we found that because letters of credit require that the bank providing the trade financing be the consignee in a, for the barrel of oil coming into the um, into the into the United States in this case we were able to identify 19 banks who had traded about 155 million barrels of Amazon crude, about $10 billion in financing. And we identified the top six banks responsible for that trade. And of those top six, um, through, um, through strategies that Kevin will elaborate on, uh, we were able to see commitments from four of them to exclude the trade financing for Amazon oil. For our financial flow research, we did look at various different sources of information. Um, Bloomberg, um, SEC filings, company and bank annual reports, sustainability reports and policies, investor presentations and things like this. So it's a combination of publicly available information and great literature. Um, and what we wanted to see next was of the banks that we had identified in the research, but also other banks that we knew were um, financiers of the Amazon oil and gas sector. Uh, what did this finance, did the financing align with their ESG and exclusion policies or climate policies and things like that? Um, and so we did a scorecard in which we were looking at um, risk management within their policies and their risk exposure measured in the amount of financing they were providing to the sector. So we identified about 155 companies operating in the Amazon oil and gas sector, looked through all of their financing um, and identified the top 14 banks that we were concerned with um, and looked if their ESG policies and exclusions and climate policies uh, were able to manage the risk or the, of their complicity in Amazon destruction, in the violation of indigenous people's rights, in pollution and corruption, biodiversity loss and deforestation. And we found that most of them failed to do this. Even when they thought they were um, creating policies that would address this, they missed very key points within those policies that would actually um, uh, would actually curtail their investment or their, sorry, their financing. Um, and that they had many, many loopholes, which allowed all sorts of financing to occur. Um, and I probably should leave it to questions if, to talk about some more of those, but um, there's a, a whole myriad of ways that the financial world has adapted to um, the pressures put on them um, in order to still provide their clients with the kinds of financing they're looking for, but do it in ways that, are, that they're less accountable for. And this was the result of that scorecard. We were really looking at risk management versus risk exposure, the laggards, the front runners, um, and identifying, um, um, excuse me, how banks either uh, they have no policies in place or they have policies in place but they don't follow them. So the ones on the bottom side of the of this chart, um, the scatter graph, are banks that don't have the policies in place, and the ones on the uh, sort of mid uh, upper side are ones that have policies 
but don't actually follow them. And you can see um, that the um, European banks tend to have the policy in place, but lots of loopholes. And American banks tend to not have the policies in place. Again, a sort of trend that we, we saw across the board. Um, and we're actually still working on this, the financial flows as well. Um, we're looking at gathering um, all of this financial information into a database, which we'll make publicly available, that identifies about 220 different banks that are involved in financing the Amazon oil and gas sector across Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, and Brazil. Um, and the amount of funding that they're providing, the types of funding, and also whether they're providing projects to, say, carbon bomb projects in the, in the region or um, major projects which we know can have incredi um, incredibly negative impacts on indigenous communities. So that work is forthcoming. Um, but that just gives you a sense of you know, how we were trying to um, provide information to indigenous groups across the Amazon, particularly in Ecuador, to inform their opposition strategies. Um, it's a modest contribution to what is a, a huge and, and long-standing effort on their behalf um, to, to fight the oil and gas sector and expansion of that sector. Um, but we feel like it's had an, um, an, it's an opportunity to provide some um, actors outside of the national context, uh, foreign banks and foreign governments, um, who may be willing to listen um, to indigenous people when they tell their story and they and they testify to the impacts of the industry um, and make decisions that um, the government and the sec and the industry in in country can influence and that can provide these points of leverage which Kevin will talk about next um, great thank you Angeline um, so basically yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about so we've done all this research and we're gonna um, kind of try to lead us through a little bit of some of the concrete um, examples of the impact that is that that has had. Um, but I, I did want to circle back for a second to, to what Angeline was was mentioning at the beginning around the you know the, the why um, you know why do this research? And I think another thing to mention is you know when we were first considering this and having the conversations with um the regional indigenous confederation um in ecuador and and Coica, the umbrella amazonian um indigenous organi organization um one of the things that we were really looking at and considering too was just you know the dynamic different dynamics um and what's changed on the ground in the country right and so um, you also had a, a couple things at play, right? You had um, a, a major influx of state-run companies, primarily Chinese state-run companies, but also a big expansion of, of Petro-Ecuador. Um, They're playing a bigger role. So some of the traditional strategies that we um, had been using over the years, you know, shareholder advocacy, direct corporate campaigning, weren't, weren't effective um, uh, in, in a state-run um, enterprise scenario. Then you also had a, a huge influx of, of small sort of EMP players that, you know, with no downstream retail, it was hard to link um, uh, any brands to that as well. So we, you know, a lot of this came out of this real need to um, look for new actors, look for new avenues of account accountability. Um, and so basically what we what we did when the, the research came in, um, you know, we uh, sat down with the indigenous organizations and trying to map out a strategy of where do we what do we do with it now right um and so particularly we looked at um the 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 bank work that angeline was explaining um and began a series of uh, basically dialogue with all those top six banks um and so that involved um yeah <laughs> lots of conversations um with, with stan and amazon watch and confinai and koika with the banks um, and it was, it basically the first agreement came in after six months. Um, and so to mention, you know, Angeline laid out, there were the, 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 the four banks that made, made commitments. Um, and yeah, to just dive into a little bit of the details. I mean, it's a, it was a significant, it was a big deal. Basically we had four banks that committed to restrict um financing for any crude coming out of ecuador and peru right and and collectively the banks were responsible for 85 percent of um of the trade finance so it was a it was a huge blow um 
just with those four banks. But then additionally, um, we had a we were in, in dialogue with UBS and, and Rabobank. Um, UBS has not made a commitment, but they have been declining um, some of the crude transactions. Rabobank interestingly said basically on the eve of our report that they were already doing it um, and that they were going to rule out doing it in the future. Um, so there was an interesting in that six months of dialogue, there was interesting, as Janjali mentioned, um, you know, some some of the banks had policies on the books and weren't applying them and others um, created created new ones. Um, so, you know, again, what 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 does this mean on the ground? So basically, um, as I said, 85 percent of the trade finance, it was 10 billion in trade financing over 10 years. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know. As Bloomberg said, I mean, these lines of credit um, are the lifeline of the Ecuadorian oil industry. So it put Petro Ecuador in a really hard, hard position. Um, so essentially, yeah, what, what it forced Petro Ecuador to do, and you can see this this article up here, I mean, basically in, in the national newspaper saying Petro Ecuador is, is encountering um, a financial blockade from four European banks, right? Um, and it basically forced Petro Ecuador to do something that um, w was pretty unprecedented. Um, and, and most of the times you see something like this, if there's sanctions involved or something, right? But they basically had to almost double uh, their list of banks approved um, to issue guarantees, right? Um, and then they had to implement a whole series of measures um, to make it, um, yeah, b basically e easier for buyers to, to, to participate. Um, and clearly, the statement from Petro Ecuador, um, you know, they had to take these measures um, because of the difficulty in obtaining letters of credit from some of these international banks as a result of these uh, restrictions. Um, so all of this, though, comes at a really important time, right? It had a big, it really um, started to restrict Petro Ecuador's ability to get its product to market, right? And um, as well, it certainly damaged their brand in addition to a whole bunch of corruption scandals that were happening. And it came at a really critical time for Petro Ecuador because the government of Guillermo Lasso um, had made doubling the oil production during his administration uh, a major priority, right? And so just on this map up here, all those green areas, that's where current production is, is happening. Um, so he was looking to greatly expand extraction in those areas. Uh, and then the southern Amazon, those those gold uh, blocks there, those were all going to be um, basically t uh, concessions that were going to be tendered this year um, for new exploration. These are roadless, um, you know, largely old growth, pristine forests, um, all indigenous territory. So you have a scenario where basically with this research, um, the banks are, you know, putting restrictions um, on Petro Ecuador. And at the same time, uh, our work in in California to affect the market for Ecuador's number one project um, uh, is also at, at play. Um, here, just some, some interestingly, here this is the the part of Ecuador's expansion plans. But the quote up there is from the president, and basically him recognizing that now that the world is realizing the need to keep fossil fuels in the ground, um, that Ecuador better get their oil out as fast as possible. Um, and here's just a, one of the first wells happening in the remote part of, of the Asuni. Um, and yeah, you know, and so turning our eyes to California a little bit, I mean, as Angeline mentioned, it's still to me astounding the fact that Ecuador, I mean, the country is the size of the state of Nevada in the United States is a small country and it's the number one uh, foreign source of oil for California um, back in the numbers that that we ran earlier but then yeah also in 2021 and now given everything with Russia we expect those numbers to also um, to, to go higher um, and obviously coming to a state that touts itself as a you know climate climate hero right um, but they're the number one consumer of this problematic crude. Um, so there, this obviously is more of a market strategy and we're having conversations with the Newsom administration and other, yeah, the Ministry of the Environment um, in California. And obviously we're, you know, the, the we're targeting them to first of all, get um, the governor to admit that California has a problem, right? It's an addict first step, obviously, is admit you have a problem. And so we're really looking for him to, to do that. 
Um, but of course, in line with the overall demands around around uh, the phase out and a refinery ramp down. But you know, and I'm not sure in terms of the the demand, you know, the the, the scissor analogy, right? That I think we're all familiar with of both sides of the blade, and you know whether this really qualifies on the that demand side of the scissor, but. What we're really looking to do, though, is to leverage movement and a concern from California um, in in Ecuador, um, and to add that to the list of um, problematic things that that force the government to um, to curtail its its exploration for for crude. Here's just some photos of of actions that were happening targeting both the Ecuadorian President Lasso, Governor Newsom, um, in California. Um, this is my attempt to do what I think young people do, right, on Instagram, the how it started, how it's going thing. <laughs> but it, it's, it, it's important because the first slide, the how it started, that was a presentation from last February from the Ecuadorian government. Um, you know, Somos Ricos, this is their plan. All those red blocks up for auction, up for extraction, right? You know, now the upcoming uh, uh, event is happening in October of this year's, and the title of it, is new, um, yeah, basically new energy challenges in Ecuador. So it's a dramatic change. Um, and, you know, I, I, maybe I'll just close by saying, I think that, you know, obviously, spoiler alert, these, these strategies, I think they're important. They're building leverage over the government, over Petro Ecuador. They're really, you know, blocking in um, Petro Ecuador's ability to expand. Um, we're affecting the market um, in California, so the, 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 the market for its number one biggest product. But, you know, obviously these strategies go hand in hand with um, a whole bunch of other strategies that we heard uh, Namonsi talking about this morning. We'll hear from Kate as well. Um, and I think that, you know, when you add up um, the all the strategies together, these are all ingredients, but I think when they're all happening at the same time, they start to build a, a recipe that um, can, pretty, can be pretty effective, I think, at restricting um, fossil fuel supply on the ground. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name's Kate. Um, I have the, the privilege of working with Namonte and Kimo at Amazon Frontlines. Um, we had originally imagined Namonte being a part of this panel, but for reasons that are perhaps obvious now to you all, she was invited to give the opening keynote um, and share some of that visionary struggle um, of her ancestral wisdom, her people's wisdom, um, to inform our collective struggles to phase out fossil fuels. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the legal basis for that claim, uh, drawing some links to the global ap applicability of those rights and discussing some of the broader political economy implications of indigenous resistance to fossil fuels. I want to start by, by trying to dimension the scale and importance of this topic. This is similar to the map that Kevin showed. Globally speaking, indigenous peoples claim and manage 50% of the world's land, 80% of the global biodiversity. This is obviously a map of the Ecuadorian Amazon. It's not the sum total of Ecuadorian petroleum production, but it is the vast majority. On the right in multiple colors, you'll see indigenous territory. On the left is mining allocations, and it's a little hard to see. I don't know if this has a, yeah, um, the green doesn't show up on the forested photos. Um, in the north, uh, the historic center of oil production, um, and in the south, as Kevin was mentioning, is the frontier and expansion of land. Block 22 is in the left-hand side of that blue stretch in the middle. That's Warani territory that Namonte spoke about. Now, obviously, not every country is going to have this same scale of overlap, but in a world where indigenous peoples control 50% of the world's land, I think it merits considering the extent to which rights intersect with fossil fuel production and supply. It's a threshold question that we have to be considering across all of our work and in all of our strategies. This is obviously the story of one country, but I think taken alongside the South African case that you've just heard, I think it offers some important lessons for our global community. Um, Ecuador is a heavily oil-dependent economy with deeply entrenched interests and a strong desire to grow oil extraction. And still, indigenous peoples in that context are finding new and innovative ways to resist that production um, and really changing the game in terms of policy approaches nationally. 
I think that's especially important in terms of what we heard this morning, in terms of the gaps within emerging economies. Historically, the Warani have defended their lands with spears from external invasions, which have become a symbol of their struggle and territorial defense. Um, I think it's important to recognize that indigenous peoples are innovators. They're holders of ancestral wisdom, but they're also incorporating new technologies and new sources of wisdom to defend their lands. The map that Namonte spoke about um, uses camera traps, GPS technology, drones to cover nearly 200,000 hectares of pristine remote forest. It covers more than 10,000 GPS points. And it was a process of collective mapping where young people who had learned the tools to map gathered together with their elders to document their hunting trails, their fishing sites, uh, where their ancestral medicine is, the trees to build canoes. Um, and fortified their community-based struggle in that process. When the community learned of the consultation, the so-called consultation that the government had conducted, they came together to plan a strategy of action and resistance. And the basis of that claim was that the government had an obligation to conduct free prior and informed uh, consultation as per the Ecuadorian constitution but failed to do so. And I want to talk just a little bit more about this right of FPIC. FPIC is a collective human right of indigenous peoples to give or withhold consent for activities that and policies that affect their lands. It's grounded in the fundamental right to self-determination. It's not simply a procedural requirement. The UN Human Rights Council noted that it's a manifestation of indigenous people's right to de self-determine their political, social, economic, and cultural priorities. Therefore, we have to think about FPIC in a wider context, and it has to be differentiated from terms that perhaps as environmental communities might understand as participation and consultation in decision making. I want to also emphasize that when we think about this as a tool for self-determination, it's also about maintaining and supporting indigenous communities in furthering and advancing their ancestral wisdom, their collective identity, that offers us a new way of relating and thinking about the world in which we live. It's about broadening the, the scope and aperture of our thinking about what's the problem that we're trying to solve and listening to indigenous peoples in their wisdom. It's a key pillar of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, and I, I, I want to note here, too, that the, the, the specific article in the UN DRIPS doesn't envision a single moment nor a single action, but a process of good faith dialogue and negotiation to achieve consent. The Ecuadorian constitution explicitly recognizes collective rights. It recognizes self-determination. Um, and in the constitution itself, the language that they use is free prior and informed consultation. That, that is less than the international standard of consent, um, but through the indigenous-led um, strategies, there has been important advances in the national jurisprudence, something that is a trend that's happening globally. Um, I want to just briefly mention what these elements mean. This is way too small to read, and I apologize for that. Free, it has to be free from intimidation, coercion, and manipulation. And indigenous peoples have the freedom to use their traditional governance structures. It has to take place in advance of the policy measure or action and not launch to a later stage to just rubber stamp something has to be adequate information and time to grapple with the often highly technical language, has to be presented in a language that indigenous peoples understand, um, and there needs to be culturally appropriate procedures for um, engaging indigenous communities. Consent uh, can only be achieved when the first three threshold criteria have been met. Um, and the withholding of consent can indicate any number of things, including that the process was flawed, it's not in their best interest, or that there's a legitimate distrust in the government's good faith. If, the, if 
the leaders of your community are being criminalized, they're under threat, their assassinations take place, it's extremely difficult to conduct a, an FPIC process in that context. The map that the Warani communities built was fundamental in demonstrating the special relationship that indigenous peoples have with their lands. And it was fundamental in establishing their right to FPIC. And in 2019, the panel of judges ruled that the Ecuadorian government must repeat the process in these communities and must adequately train the ministry in conducting FPIC processes. The ruling itself protected 200,000 hectares of indigenous lands directly, but because the government had applied the same FPIC consultation process to the whole of the many oil blocks that were up for auction at that time, it indirectly protected several hundred thousand more because that prior consultation process had been ruled unconstitutional. I want to just briefly mention another community in the north, the uh, Ai Kofan community of Sinangue, who similarly brought suit against the government when they, indigenous land patrols who were patrolling their territory found that the government had allocated mining concessions adjacent to their land without their prior consultation. In that instance, and importantly establishing a precedent, the government ruled that the the, the courts ruled that the government has an obligation to conduct FPIC even when the activity happens outside of indigenous lands, but has a meaningful impact on those lands. In 2020, the Constitutional Court of Ecuador selected both the Warani and Sinangue cases for constitutional review. We were hoping that they would consider them jointly. They've taken them sequentially one at a time. And the court in February of this year established the historic right to consent. It goes beyond the Constitution, which, which had previously recognized only consultation, to recognize consent. Um, it, it forms a growing body of jurisprudence globally recognizing FPIC as we transition from a human rights norm recognized in international instruments to more binding, more operational jurisprudence at the national level. And it happened after the very first constitutional court hearing in indigenous territory in Ecuador. So there's really incredible footage of judges. It's time to wrap up. Oh, boy. Just one more slide, I think. Um, the Warani case is still pending at the constitutional court, but we anticipate that they'll provide additional jurisprudence on standards and protocols. Um, just very quickly, I, the indigenous movement in Ecuador has proven to be quite important political actors in the national policy development. They're the, the two decrees that Kevin mentioned were the subject of litigation in 2021 when they were first issued. And in June of this year, the indigenous movement mobilized a national strike across the whole of the country, shutting down the country for nearly 18 days and forcing the government to the negotiating table, at which point they agreed to derogate the executive decree on doubling oil production and revise the mining decree to include FPIC. It is a major, major win for the indigenous movement. And just a couple of weeks ago, as a part of the, the dialogue groups they agreed to a short-term moratorium on the expansion frontier and to not issue new mining permits until a new law on FPIC is developed. The, can I just say two slides real quickly? I know you're um, <laughs> right at the end. I just wanna, I just wanna say to reiterate that I think the points that, that Johan and, and Kevin have mentioned that indigenous peoples are key rights holders and political actors capable of achieving meaningful reform and that indigenous people's rights need to be considered as a part of our broader fossil fuel strategies. Um, and that community-based collective governance is key to these strategies. Sorry for going over. No, thank you very much. Yeah. And thank you to and thank you to all the panelists to to keeping on time. Really <laughs> made my job <laughs> easier. Oh, it went well. Um, I just wanted to uh, give two points of reflection, if I may, as, as moderator. Um, I mean, just to take a step back that 
the um, all of these kind of acupuncture pressure points that we use has been really, really key for both these movements related to oil as well as for other ones related to mining and also stopping deforestation. And it's really clear, as Nonne was also saying, how if communities are organized, it's the principal element for then our collective struggles together with lawyers, scientists, research, communications efforts to really push uh, for these kinds of outcomes. But I, I also want to say how you know, in Latin America in particular, around free prior informed consent and the use of consultation has also been used to stop mining projects for over two or three decades. And there are some really emblematic cases there that are very much worth uh, studying that, that also can share a lot of lessons for oil impacted communities or communities where oil wants to go in. And, and also want to remark how incredibly emblematic and important it is the case in the wild coast in South Africa. Their struggle started in, 19, in around 1996, and it wasn't until 2018 that they got a, a, a statement from the court saying that they had to stop the mining there. Um, based on this topic, on this right to free prior and informed consent, and if I'm not mistaken, was the first case on the continent to win that kind of, to, to win that, um, to win. <laughs> um, so extremely worthwhile also uh, speaking with her and, and old Johan afterwards about that. Uh, clearly this is a, a collective effort and I think also with, with all of that it is a, a definitely a way also forward in terms of stopping projects which is important locally but it's also extremely relevant globally for people who are living in other parts of the world to get to know the local struggles and link those up with also a global climate movement. So I just wanted to share some of my own reflections there and kind of wrapping that up and open it up for questions or comments and discussions. So, my glasses on. so we'll start here with a young man and then we'll take, is that a, can you please say your name, where you're from and who you're directing the question to and if you don't mind we can take uh, two or three questions and then do a second round so okay I got confused when you said young men I didn't know about <laughs> but, but thanks um, yes. I'm uh, Carl from uh, Denmark Aubrey University um, first of all thank you very much for this super interesting and inspiring session um, I normally don't work in this um, this environment so it's it's very it's very exciting for me and I hope it's okay to ask silly questions, even though we are in Oxford. Yes. Um, uh, so it's um, maybe to Nonle and, and Nemonte and all the others, thank you so much for all your work and your, and your struggles. And um, it's really super inspiring. I was wondering, um, as a silly question, um, so now we are going from one battle to the next, it seems. Um, what, what, is, what is the long term in this can we at some point stop battling and just say, okay, um, we just don't do it anymore. No more, <laughs> no more extractions. And, and, and I don't have a good answer to it myself, but, um, but it seems to me that, um, that uh, I guess more people have to become indigenous simply just to, to grow the group of, of people that that are um, that are aligned and um, are together on this. So, so I don't know if it would be about inviting some some executives into the forests and, and, and living into the communities just to 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 bring them to bring them together. Um, what we work with in in our protected northern European bubble is co-development. Um, so, so I guess um, the question of if it is not oil, what else? could be acceptable will come up at some point. Um, and so, so uh, would that be a way for, for to co-develop alternatives that bring value, first of all, to the indigenous communities, could be by adding nat nature values, by adding to the diversity in these areas. Um, yeah, so I stop here. Thank you. And we'll take one question. Um, yes, here. And then, sorry, there was one Yes, you, the lady. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I get. So my name <laughs> is is uh, Felipe Corral. I, I study at the uh, Berlin in Germany. Um, 
And my question is a, a little bit to to the whole panel. Uh, so so before uh, in the the initial um, remarks, we heard that there is a huge expansion in renewable energies that is needed uh, uh, to to solve the climate puzzle. And we've heard from the Monte um, and from the speakers here that that uh, until now usually the the way that the fossil fuel supply works implies almost inherently that communities are to be inter impacted, intervened, displaced, uh, uh, dispossessed to some extent. And the question is, uh, to what extent do you think we're missing a conversation, honest conversation on coloniality in these kind of, kind of spaces, like in the praxis of transitions, so to begin not reproducing now what's happening with oil, gas and coal in a couple of years with copper, lithium, um, uh, iron ore, uh, etc. Hello, uh, thank you all for your presentations. Uh, my name is Amanda and I work for a sustainable finance think tank in Germany. And I have a question for Angeline. Um, so you said you were engaging with banks that are funding oil and gas extraction. Um, my question is how and how has that process been? Um, and as kind of a follow up, I was wondering, um, maybe it's easy for banks to identify where there's oil and gas extraction funding happening in their portfolios. But I'm curious, <laughs> OK, and if not, um, you know, how are they doing that? And I'm curious about how banks can identify um, commodity driven deforestation in their portfolios. And are there any lessons from what you've seen, uh, how banks do that for oil and gas extraction? Thanks. Thank you for your questions. Uh, non Claire, you want to go uh, take the first question? maybe? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I hope uh, I get it right. The first question of uh, what is the long term? I yeah. Well, I think when you ask the long term, you referring a uh, what can be sustainable sustainability. If I get it right, your question. Um, yeah. Right now, we can see that uh, to fix the, the crisis economy, we are more pushing the short term, uh, which is going to hit us badly. Uh, we need to find a long term uh, for our, our economy. Oil and gas is a short term. If we look, uh, the natural resources on the ground are diminishing completely. Diamond, gold, you know, on the ground are uh, starting to be depleted, to be finished. Uh, that is why now we focusing to go to the ocean, hardly, uh, to extract as much as possible. Also, oil and gas in the ocean is going to finish. When it finished both, where we go? What is the solution? Those are the questions that we need to ask, but it's a pity uh, there's no time for that. Uh, the developers are not here to talk, are here to make business. That's the problem. And when you push that space for talking, uh, you pushed out because, because you are delaying uh, the development. That's how we've been uh, 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 painted as an activist, that uh, communities need jobs. Uh, we can't listen your argument. Your argument, you can't argue while people are starving. But this starving is, I mean, this food is for whom? Because if you see right now on the issue of shale in South Africa, uh, the whole communities, they said no to oil and gas. But the state say yes. And the question, who are they representing to? Whose interest? Yeah, those are the issues. But we do have alternative, uh, we do have long term. Uh, agriculture, tourism, if we do those things, it can bring our economy back to normal. But you can see that tourism and agriculture, it's a slow making profit. 
but mining is a quick way of making money. Those are the dilemmas that we are facing. And when we talk about the climate change as well, we need to play our cards very carefully because agriculture also, it give a negative impact to our climate change. Now we need to, to play our cards very carefully. What type of agriculture that we need to put in place? And for example, in our case, we do permanent agriculture. Permanent agriculture as well, uh, it doesn't suit uh, the big corporates because it does not make profit. It means that everything what we are doing is about profit. It's not about living, which is going to cause a lot of harm to our 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 earth. Um, yeah, that's my 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 question on on that one. And also on the renewable energy, if I'm I may proceed, renewable energy also is a, a hot potato debate. <laughs> <laughs> um. You know, I can make an example. Uh, in our case in South Africa, you see the president of South Africa speak a little bit much better when it comes to renewable energy, that yes, let's go to renewable energy. But his own minister, which is the Minister of Minerals and Energy, he's completely against. It tells you that we have a problem. Now, um, the minister says, I'm a, it's my final word because I'm the minister of energy. Now you are the president, but you can't rule. Uh, this is my work. Those are the dilemmas uh, that we are facing because the minister says that no, renewable energy is too expensive. We can't afford that. But yes, it's too expensive. But can we just go to destroy the planet in order to afford? I don't think so. I think it's a good time. We have too much wind outside with too much sun. <laughs> you know, why can't we utilize those things that are not going to destroy the Mother Earth? Yeah. Thank you. I think you had a question, Angelina? Oh, yes. Are we done the first two? Yeah. Um, I have the if anyone question. else wants Does to answer else the wanna... first two. Okay. Um, so uh, on the first part of that question on engaging with banks, um, I think that one of the, we sort of had the element of surprise with the trade finance research because um, banks didn't expect that that was a, uh, an avenue, a line of inquiry, let's say. And we didn't really know that it's, you know, within the stand research group that I work in, we, we take our time, we pull a lot of threads. Um, it's part of being creative in our research. And this wasn't actually something we had start, you know, started out um, with the idea in mind that this would be where our research went. But finding the banks in the, as consignees um, in a bill of laden in trade flow and customs data um, was made me very curious. And um, <laughs> it just happened that, that because of the state of Ecuador's economy, letter of credit financing was quite common. And they, a bank has to be the consignee because they are essentially assuring that, um, that the payment will be made. And um, and so they, they didn't really anticipate that they'd be tracked in this way. And I think we put out the report, um, a lot of banks were caught on their back foot. Um, and because the, there was a lot of new policy, um, maybe only a few years old in some cases for banks, um, uh, related to excluding financing from, for projects um, and, and for corporate financing, um, and trade financing, um, excluding that from projects that caused deforestation, biodiversity loss, that were in intact forest landscapes, that were um, violated indigenous people's rights, although there's a real free prior informed consultation thing that happens in the finance, it's not con consent, so there's a, um, a, a disconnect there. And so they were caught on the back foot with this, um, not really seeing that this trade financing piece would, would come out, or that we could track it, because it's a very kind of, um, a uh, black box kind of uh, kind of area of uh, financing, and I think that's why they engaged. Um, we also had some good connections um, and could could reach out to to people within the organ within the bank. Um, and the reason why they com committed to these policies is that I think a lot of them saw that they wanted to step away from this type of um, 
this kind of engagement with their clients. But as I sort of hinted at in the presentation, the way that they're, what they're moving into is not necessarily a reduction in financing for the oil trade. Um, they're moving towards revolving credit facilities and syndicated loans, where you have more than one bank, and therefore no, no bank is on the line for applying their particular set of ESG commitments or exclusion policies. Um, and that means that they can provide even more funding, but they do it in an environment where they're held less accountable. So um, I think we also hit them at a time when they were already thinking, well, if we move to revolving credit facilities and syndicated loans, this won't happen again. Thank and you, Angelina. I, I sorry. encourage you to, sorry, I encourage you to continue that conversation later if we can make it to lunch. I just want to give uh, the last word to Johan. Yeah, just one thing on the question of um, long term and people becoming in, indigenous and uh, coloniality is I asked Nancle ahead of this talk why she thought her community had won the uh, victory against Shell in a context where environmentalists had, had failed. And what she said is that environmentalists and NGOs separate the human being from nature and they protect the nature and not the human being. But for communities, we are not excluding anything we connect these two the human being and nature. We are connected by nature as this community. In order to live, we are dependent on nature. And I think there's something really fundamental there to, I don't think the, uh, to reconceive of how we think about the global economy and how we approach each of these issues. I don't think sending execs to become indigenous is the solution. I think the solution is transforming the economy in which they work to, because fundamentally, there's no question that we only have one planet and that we, if the planet doesn't live, we don't live. Um, so I think that's a really powerful way of reorienting. And um, that means that if with renewables, we're not rethinking how we engage with indigenous communities, we're just going to go into the same pitfalls and the same problems. So I think that's, that's very important that we're one with nature. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't want to hold you off from your lunch. And I know we're all timed in a lunch for those who are 12.15 or <laughs> it's time. Um, so please, let's give a round of applause to all our panelists.